Hey guys, it's your girl Sage. I hope you're having a wonderful day or night whenever this video finds you. I'm here with Our Daily Bread, and for today we have Jonah chapter 3. Jonah preaches at Nineveh. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believe. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid it aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered in, with sackcloth, and cry mightily to God, Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Short but sweet, and let's go ahead and talk about it. Um, Jonah is probably one of, um, I don't want to say my favorite prophet, but he's kind of up there. Um, and I say that because I just crack up at this, at the book of Jonah, just overall when I read it. Because um, Jonah's being very stubborn. So we know that Jonah did not want to preach this word in Nineveh because he hated Nineveh. Nineveh had this notorious reputation of just like, thieves and murderers and and everything bad that you can imagine you know prostitutes everywhere just all these ungodly unholy people just living there and caring about their wicked schemes to hurt one another all to get rich quick um but nonetheless god is um asking jonah to go and preach a word to them um, uh, because the Lord does not do things without speaking first. The Lord does not give warning first before he does something, you know, and, and the Lord's in control of all things. But this is why it's important to have a relationship with the Lord, because with Jonah being in good standing with the Lord, despite his disobedience, the Lord is still using him to deliver this message. And the Lord is actually purposely using him. And there's a bigger reason for it that we see later on in the book of Jonah. I highly encourage you to read it if you haven't already. It's short, but it's sweet, but it's very, it's very comical, I should say. Um, but nonetheless, you know, so the Lord is still able to use Jonah despite his disobedience. And it's kind of parallel to the way that the Lord is still able to redeem all of these thieves, murderers, prostitutes, whatever you want to call it. He's able to redeem them for their disobedience and wickedness in the same way that he's able to redeem and use Jonah in that, in that same way. So it's almost like a, um, it's almost like an ironic point that's being made here. Um, cause again, Jonah, what he's doing is he hates the people of Nineveh. He hates the city of Nineveh, you know, and that's why he was disobedient. That's why he got eaten by the giant fish and was in its stomach for three days and finally got spit out after he prayed for mercy. And that's kind of symbolic for what happens with the people here. You know, the people, they hear this message um, right here in Jonah chapter three, verse four. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So it's funny because this actually does end up happening. Um, cause the people, they believe the word that's spoken from the prophet Jonah and their response to it is they immediately freak out. They, you know, they tear their clothes. And, um, so these are all practices of mourning, by the way, um, in Hebrew culture customs, um, they tear their clothes, you know, they sprinkle ash about their head. They, um, they're fasting, they're praying to the Lord for mercy, all of these things, but they're doing it so 
I, I, I mean, fiercely came to mind, but I guess so profoundly that they're even having their animals feast, uh, or I'm sorry, not feast, fast. They're even having their animals fasting. So not even their livestock can eat. But but here's the thing. It's important for their livestock to eat because that's their primary source of food. So if they are that desperate to appeal to the Lord so that he would um, relent from sending his anger, that they are willing to risk the source of their food. I mean, they're not only fasting themselves. Now they're risking their future sources of food when they're done fasting. But they are doing this to such an extreme degree that the Lord, he sees that they have the fear of God in him, in them. They see that, or I'm sorry, he sees that his, the people of Nineveh have the fear of God in them. He sees that they are repenting of their wickedness. He sees that they are, they are serious about their standing with the Lord and they are serious about this warning that they received. And because of this, God has mercy upon them and relents from sending his anger, you know, and this is a great example of when we confess our sins that the Lord is faithful to forgive us. Um, but more than that, too, God knows our hearts. He pays attention to our standing. You know, when there's a difference between when we say I repent, but we don't actually do anything about it and actual true repentance. Um, it's very similar to when you're apologizing to somebody and you say, oh, I'm sorry, but then you go back and just do that thing again. Whereas a true apology comes with, I'm sorry, I admit what I did was wrong, and I know that it offended you or hurt you. I'm sorry that that happened, and even whether it was your intention or not, um, you know, and, but what I am seeking is to improve upon what I did that offended you so we can better understand each other, but also to truly show you how sorry I am. Um, and I'm saying it all like that because I know everyone's situation with apologizing is different. Um, cause sometimes, sometimes apologies come from misunderstandings, but in, let's just break it down to this. I'm sorry for my actions and I'm going to change my actions to show you how sorry I am. And that's exactly what the people do here. Um, and when God sees this very faithfully, like somebody that you might be in a relationship with, whether it's a family member, friendship, romantic relationship, spouse, etc., cetera, um, you know, that apology received is received by the Lord and he relents from sending his anger. And again, it's just showing his mercy, but it's also showing that he doesn't desire to send wrath upon his people. He doesn't desire to have his prophets swallowed by giant fish. He doesn't desire them to just be condemned. Yes, the Lord may convict us through the Holy Spirit when we do wrong at times, but condemnation is not the word, the voice of the Lord. You know, condemnation is the voice of the enemy. He will, the Lord will convict us. He will send us warnings to change from our, our wicked ways, but he will not just make us feel continual shame for that. And the reason for that is because, especially now through the New Testament, through the new covenant form, through the blood of Jesus, we've already been forgiven. We've received forgiveness because Jesus already paid the price for all of our sin. But also, that doesn't give us a right to just continue on sinning. When we know that we're sinning, when we know that we've been convicted in our soul by the gift of the Holy Spirit sent to us through the blood of Jesus, when we know we've sinned, when we know we've acted up, you know, that's when we have a choice to make. And that choice being, do we repent? Do we seek to change our ways? Do we seek the Lord to help us change our ways? Or do we just decide... I like the way I've been doing things. I'm going to keep doing things my way and continue in in our sin. Because remember, the Lord has blessed us with free will and he loves us so much that he's going to allow us to have our free will. However, at the same time, if we choose sin over the Lord, he's going to hand us over to our sin and we know that the wages of sin are death. And whether that be, whether that be, our sin leads us to situations that could cause us to die or could cause us to harm ourselves in a way that we would. But nonetheless, our sin leads us to a spiritual death that separates us from the Lord because we know that sin 
is God hates sin. He doesn't hate the sinner. He hates sin. God has mercy for the sinner in the same way that a doctor has mercy for someone who's sick or ill or injured. You know, that's why Jesus tells the Pharisees that it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. And that's how God sees us when we're struggling with our sin. It's, it's not, it's not a condemning thing. It's, he tries to help us. And the way he tries to help us is through speaking to us, you know, whether it be through our spirit, whether it be through signs that, that kind of show us the way in which we've been sinning and not only hurting ourselves, but other people. Um, and also just getting to spend time with the Lord, getting to know him in his word as well. You know, all of it helps us kind to, you know, we understand what's no longer serving us. And in the same way that when we look at a plant that has dead branches or necrotic branches that we need to cut off so the plant can become more fruitful, but also keep it from dying, we have to allow the Lord to do that in our lives too. And that starts with us heeding the word of the Lord in the same way that the people of Nineveh did. Again, these people, they were murderers, thieves, prostitutes, whatever you want to go with, right? Just the worst of the worst. They had this awful reputation. And even they felt the conviction. They, you know, they, they felt the conviction. And again, beginning of wisdom starts with fear of the Lord. They had that fear of the Lord. And that's what caused them to make the wise decision to fast, to repent, to show the Lord that they were done with their wicked ways because they did not want to face his wrath because they had fear of the Lord. They knew what he can do. And that's why it's so important for us to remember fear of the Lord as well. We should remember fear of the Lord because of the great and awesome and mighty things that he can do. He, you know, he creates rivers and deserts, but he can also dry up rivers and turn them into deserts. He can take a vineyard and turn it into a barren land. Do not underestimate what the Lord can do in our lives, good or bad. And that's why it's so important for us to trust in him, but also to seek him daily. Because when we seek him daily, especially as revering him, as a way that a child reveres their parents, you know, a child that reveres and respects and loves their parents, they're not going to willingly go and disobey their parents. They're going to seek their parents' counsel, guidance, and instruction, and also go to them when they've done wrong and need help. And that's what the Lord wants from us as well. He doesn't want us to run away from him when we've sinned, when we've messed up. He doesn't want us to be like Jonah because, you know, the Lord, he's going to continue to pursue us anyways. But the more we run from the Lord, you know, the further, the more desolate of a circumstance he's going to finally catch up to us in. But again, all he wants is to love us in the same way that a parent who, whether their child was on their best behavior or their worst behavior, the same way a parent wants to nurture that child and help them grow into a fruitful, morally upright adult that is a blessing, not just to them, but to others that they interact with in the world as well. But in any case, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and wrap this up here with a scripture that the Lord brought to me for this word today. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. Um, and that kind of has a double meaning to it. So a wise son brings joy to his father. This means, um, and, and it's very important that we pay attention to the dynamic of these relationships here. A wise son brings joy to his father. So um, the father's role in a son's life is to kind of show him how to grow up and become a man. Um, the things that he needs to do, the responsibilities that he will one day be um, responsible for taking care of himself. Um but then right here, so a wise son brings joy to his father. This is representing that it is a son, a child that heeds instruction when it's received. Um, and then right here, this second part right here, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. So the mother's role is again, known for nurturing and also being there when, um, when the child is in need of like, either food or, or, um, or just that emotional comfort. And, and again, I'm going to very basic building block foundations, uh, here. I'm not saying that parents aren't capable of doing both, but I'm going with the most traditional understanding here. Again, the mother is known as being the, the one that 
you know, when the child falls, takes care of that, that, um, cut or injury, you, it, it, almost like the nurse, if you will. Um, but also feeding and a comfort, you know, kind of nurturing the emotional needs of the child. But a foolish son brings grief to his mother. It almost makes the mother feel like, first off, she might have made a mistake bringing this child into the world. And I'm, I know that's like a really dirty thing to say. Um, and I'm not saying it to like out anybody, but it, it's more about a foolish son bringing grief to his mother. It, I mean, imagine how much a child would need to act up for a mother to go, I wish I had never had this child. I, I really should not have done this, you know? So, and, and that's kind of the extreme I'm going with here. Um, I don't think many moms really feel that way. And I'm not talking about, um, post, post, um, well, it's that depression that happens after having a child. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like a foolish son, like that again, is like maybe constantly being brought home by the cops. And it's to the point where the mom's like, I, I just got to leave this kid at juvie because there's nothing I can do. It's kind of that feeling. Um, but also, also that same feeling that might be occurring in the mom with that type of son who perhaps is like, what did, did I spoil him too much? Did I not discipline him enough? Like what happened to you? And, and, and just kind of left wondering what they could have done better, you know, but again, that it's that grief. So that's why that scripture is very powerful. Um, cause you know, at first I remember reading it going, why is it interchanged between father and mother? And again, it has entirely to do with the different roles that the father and mother take. But we also have to remember too, that the Lord, the Lord is everything. He's the alpha, the omega, he's the beginning, he's the end. Um, and also the Lord, while we refer to the Lord as he, he is also our comfort. He is also our rock. He is also the one that we lean on for emotional stability. You know, so the Lord, he, he plays both roles of mother and father in our lives, but primarily, um, our relationship with them is heavenly father, but he also is that comfort to us as well. And, and kind of almost similar to like how a uh, single father would kind of play both roles for his child as well. It, it's more like that because, um, Again, we have a heavenly father. We do not have a queen of heaven or anything in that, despite what the Bible may have thought at one moment. Um, and, I, and when I say that, I'm talking about uh, mainly in the book of Jeremiah, where they were talking about a queen of heaven. But the Lord said, I never declared there was a queen of heaven. Um, but nonetheless, before I go off any further tangents, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this word up here. I'm praying that this message blessed someone. And if it did, feel free to like subscribe. And until next time, I hope all of y'all take care. Bye-bye.